Hi, everyone. So this is Sunita Kumari from Cold Spring Harbor Lab. And let me take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Nick Prowart. Thank you, Nick, for being here and finding time for the webinar for this forum. So Dr. Nick Prowart is a professor of plant cyber infrastructure and system biology. And he's also chair of the Department of Cell and Systems Biology at the University of Toronto. Dr. Nick Prowart is one of the founding members of the International Arabidopsis Informatics Consortium and president of the Multinational Arabidopsis Steering Committee. He's also in advisory board for the Plant Cell Atlas project. Dr. Prowart has published 127 papers, including book chapters, and has, has over 16,000 citations. He was a graduate highly cited researcher in 2018, 19, and 20 in the field of plant and animal sciences. So this list recognizes world-class researchers selected for their exceptional research performance. Since 2002, he has been at the University of Toronto, where he set up one of the first online bioinformatics resource for plants in 2003. Currently, the bioanalytic resource, also called as a BAR in short form, comprising tools for co-expression analysis of publicly available gene expression data, cis element prediction, identifying molecular markers, generating EFP representations of gene expression patterns, and exploring protein-protein interactions in Arabidopsis and other plant species. You will be surprised to know that this resource receives about 4 million page views a month by plant researchers worldwide. So now let us get more information on this valuable resource from Nick himself. His topic of talk is on raising the bar for hypothesis generation in plant biology using open big data. Over to you, Nick. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Sunita, for the kind introduction. And thanks to Leonore to, for the invitation uh, to speak uh, to you. Um, we've participated for many years in the Ag Biodata Consortium booth at uh, various uh, PAGs and other venues. Um, and it's nice to be able to speak to you today. So uh, I'm just going to start the presentation. Can everyone see the slide? Yes. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, awesome. So uh, let me do this. Here we go. So as Sunita said, I run something called the Bioanalytic Resource for Plant Biology, uh, the BAR. Um, and this is an online resource uh, that contains lots and lots of um, biological data for plants, for, mainly for Arabidopsis, but also for, for uh, several other plant species. Um, this is the Twitter handle up here, so at bar underscore plant bio. Uh, if you would like to tweet uh, about anything you hear today, or if you have any ideas, you can also, of course, email me at uh, my university email address. Um, so we are in the 22nd year of the uh, Arabidopsis genome. I call that Anno Genominus uh, XX. I, I, so 22, so many sequences, so much knowledge, question mark. So if we look at the gene ontology molecular function um, pie chart, uh, uh, this, these are data actually from, from Leonor uh, last, from last year actually, so slightly out of date, but still the, the trend is, is generally the same. The largest piece of that pie is go uh, molecular function unknown. And you know, these other categories are, uh, sometimes quite genes are slotted into those categories in kind of an abstract kind of way, transferase activity, or, you know, really there, there can be quite a poor specification in, for some of these other categories. The same thing is, is roughly true for the uh, gene ontology biological process uh, pie chart. So just how can we use uh, these large data sets uh, for hypothesis generation? And I thought it would be useful to go back to uh, when I was doing my PhD work uh, back in 1997, uh, where we were looking at the guard cells of droughted plants. And guard cells function by uh, increasing osmotic uh, potential and thereby allowing uh, you know, the, the stomata to open and close. Um, and there are two main sources of, of organic, uh, uh, of osmotic gum, osmotica, so both potassium and, and, and uh, organic osmotica, sucrose and malate. 
Uh, and we did an experiment droughting potato plants. So I was in Germany, potatoes are very big in Germany. And uh, we droughted these plants and we measured water potential uh, after the start of withholding water in the leaves at the top of plants. And you can see that the water potential in these leaves doesn't really change, but both assimilation and transpiration quite rapidly uh, decrease in response to uh, drought, basically. And then when you rewater the plants, uh, the you know, the water potential recovers quite quickly, the, the small drop in water potential. But uh, in fact, it takes quite a long time for assimilation and transpiration to, um, to come back up to, to normal levels. And so what we, we were inter interested in understanding why uh, this is happening. And we did uh, what a lot of people were doing, which is the uh, RNA blot analysis, northern analysis. First, we needed a preparation of guard cell RNA. And I developed a method which involved like throwing the leaves in the blender, blending the leaves, and then just retaining the epidermal fragments through a sieving method. Um, here's a dye that's specific for RNA, Cyto12. And you can see that only the only cells that survive this blending procedure are in fact guard cells and the epidermal frag, the, the epidermal cells actually die. So this is kind of like cell type specific profiling uh, from 25 years ago. So uh, what we did was these blots, northern blots. I don't know if uh, I think some of you might be familiar with them. And we saw like strong decreases in inwardly rectifying potassium channels, proton ATPases, which provide the, um, the proton motor force to, to generate this uh, osmotic potential, uh, changes in guard cell PEP carboxylase, uh, sucrose transporter expression, lots of different uh, genes that are involved in um, creating these sort of uh, the, the machinery to, to allow things to, um, to, to, to uh, not proceed normally. Uh, and so we came up with this model where we, you know, these things are downregulated, things get changed in response to drought. So basically there's transcriptional reprogramming happening in response to drought. Now, uh, fast forward, you know, a couple of decades, and you can do thousands of northerns in one run. And here's uh, the output of a flow cell. And I've just highlighted here the, the handful of genes that we were looking at in, in response to drought. And, you know, we were coming up with some kinds of like uh, um, hypotheses based on very limited data. And now, of course, the idea is we can use this whole universe of data to uh, actually generate hypotheses. Sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded introduction, but what I'm going to tell you today is about using uh, large data sets for hypothesis generation. I'll touch on expression and co-expression data, protein-protein interaction data, protein tertiary structure data, and then tools for integrating co-expression, PPI, and other data. And I'll also finish by talking about uh, my work with the International Rabbitopsis Informatics Consortium, as well as uh, a bit of work that I've been doing with the Plant Cell Atlas. So uh, gene expression data can guide wet lab experiments, as you know. Uh, so this is a, just an example from, from uh, a while ago uh, from a colleague who was interested in uh, the first steps of um, shikimate biosynthesis. And that, those, that, that first step is catalyzed by 3 deoxy d heptalosinate 7 phosphate synthase, DHS. Um, and there are three genes encoding this uh, enzyme in, in Arabidopsis, DHS1, 2, and 3. And in fact, if we um, look, when, when my colleague looked at the knockout plants uh, of each of those genes, you know, you order the, the mutant from the stock center, look at it under normal conditions, there was no phenotype. They looked perfectly fine. So then uh, I advised him to turn to gene expression data to see where and when those isoforms are being in, it, it induced. And in fact, you see um, strong induction in uh, UVB in response to UVB light, 
Uh, and lo and behold, when you expose the three uh, knockouts to UV light, uh, you do then see a phenotype. So this is the wild type of plant exposed to UV, whereas if you knock out DHS1, 2, or 3 and expose those plants to UV light, you, you can see a phenotype. So really, uh, using gene expression data just in this simple way, almost trivial way, can really help you narrow down the phenotypic search space to understand what a particular uh, gene is doing. Uh, so we developed a tool uh, in 2007 now uh, called uh, the Electronic Fluorescent Pictograph Browser um, that allows you to explore uh, gene expression response in these large data sets that have been generated over the years. And we can see that uh, DHS3 is actually quite strongly expressed in the stem. So red coloring denotes strong expression. Uh, there's also a bit of expression in, in floral organs. Um, and there are various features associated with the EFP browser. I don't know if uh, you've used this, but basically you can switch between different sources. Uh, you can view in absolute relative and compare modes, um, and you can uh, then click out and go back to the, the archival databases uh, to, to understand um, the experiments in more detail. You can also see how that gene of interest, your gene of interest is expressed relative to the expression of all of the other genes that are available to be viewed in this particular view. Uh, there's also a color scale that tells you how strongly a uh, gene is expressed in which tissues, red is stronger. And then um, you can also click on these little magnifying glasses to drill down to some cell type uh, specific data sets that we've uh, curated over the years. Um, we've also got some, you know, root cell type specific data sets. Uh, there's a light series, many, many different uh, data sets that we've continued to add to over the years. Uh, here we see DHS3 is strongly expressed in uh, the seed coat. Um, what its role there is, is, is not known, but certainly the strong expression pattern would suggest it's doing something there. Um, there's also a natural variation series. We've got like a Klepikova atlas. Um, that's based on RNA-seq data. We also have some single cell RNA-seq data from uh, John Schiefelbein's lab at the University of Michigan, uh, where you can actually see the expression in certain uh, clusters of, of individual cells from uh, the root. So we've been working on uh, trying to create a custom ePlant EFP editor for the bar. And the input would be a table of gene expression values, summarized gene expression values, uh, or BAM files uh, for summarization, as well as an SVG image. You would upload both of these to the interface. Here's a screen grab of the interface. Uh, and this was uh, work with uh, Sebastian uh, van den Acker at Cambridge, uh, who actually was a, sort of a beta tester for us for this interface. And he has a nematode data set and he kind of worked with us to, to test it out. We're still sort of putting the finishing touches on this, but it will be possible soon for you to generate your own SVG views. Uh, and then if you wish to uh, make those available through the bar to the world. Um, another thing that we're trying to do is to organize gene expression data uh, based on this idea of uh, expressologs, which we came up with in 2012. So the, the, I told you that DHS3 is strongly expressed in the stems and to a certain extent in the flowers. So if you click on this expressolog uh, button, uh, what you're taken to is, is a tree. You're familiar with phylogenetic trees, but, uh, and this, these gray circles here denote sequence similarity. So the darker the gray, uh, the more sequence similar are the um, uh, homologs. And then these red uh, to yellow circles denote expression pattern similarity in equivalent tissues in other species. So um, you'll note that for poplar, for instance, there's this, this gene here, is not very uh, expression similar. It doesn't have a very similar expression pattern, small circle, not as red. Uh, and we see that in fact, this uh, gene is not that strongly expressed in the, in the stem tissue. But if we go back and we look at the one, uh, the homolog that is denoted as the express log, uh, we actually do see strong expression in, in the stem. So you can also download, of course, uh, um, the, the, the sequence alignments that were used to, to generate these data sets. 
Uh, we have a small farm of EFP browsers, lots of different species that we've added uh, over the years. Uh, potato, grape, uh, camelina, fisca matrella, wheat. A uh, nice feature of wheat is that we actually have organized the data by the homeologs, by their homeologs. So for instance, for this particular gene, um, which is on the A genome of wheat, so it's, uh, it's hexaploid, uh, we see this kind of expression pattern, but we can actually see the expression pattern of the two homeologs on the other genomes, the B genome and the D genome, simply by clicking on those. And we actually see that there's a kind of a, an expression difference. I don't know if you can, I'll just do back and forth. And you see that those two homeologs are showing different patterns of expression, which is quite interesting. Um, so we uh, wanted to uh, reimagine the EFP browser, and we came up with this uh, zoomable user interface uh, concept drawing where you could navigate from the kilometer scale all the way down to the, the nanometer scale, uh, which is the protein structures, um, and then across species. And uh, in particular for the um, you know, the centimeter scale expression, we, we've kind of redone this with, with SVG images instead of bitmap images. Uh, we've added in, um, you know, RNA-seq data. We've also made these images available uh, under an open license, a CCBY license. Um, so you don't need our permission to publish them as long as you uh, cite the publication, um, just to make things a little bit more open. Um, we also wanted uh, to uh, kind of make RNA-seq data more accessible. Um, and uh, the idea here was that, well, let's not only look at these read map profiles, uh, uh, let's also look at their summarized expression values in the tissues that the, the RNA-seq data were, were generated from. And then can we also sort these read maps to identify potential you know, read maps that map to a given splice isoform better than others. And um, in fact, uh, we've, we've built this and you can sort of see quite nicely uh, uh, for, this is a SR34 gene, that some, you know, some genes, uh, some, some reads do map to intronic regions. Um, and in fact, you can drill down uh, after the principle of details on demand to, um, those reads in to view those reads in a tool called uh, IGBI, Integrated Genome Browser from Anne Lorraine's lab at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Uh, and here we see that uh, sort of retention event in more detail down to the nucleotide level, really. Uh, so what, you know, what the role of that, it's known that SR34 is actually alternatively spliced, but you can see that in detail and you can also view that for, for any other gene that you're interested in and see if there's alternative potential alternative splicing happening. Uh, so now I'm shifting gears to co-expression analysis on publicly available gene expression data. And we developed uh, one of the first tools called Expression Angler for co-expression analysis, easy to use, enter your gene, uh, select a data set or compendium. Um, and you know, in our value cutoff, we use the Pearson correlation coefficient to assess expression similarity across all of the, the expression data sets. Uh, or um, a little known feature of this uh, tool is the ability to design a vector uh, where you could say, I am looking for genes that are not expressed in any tissues except salt stress roots at 24 hours. So down here at the bottom uh, left, you can see I've entered 100 for that vector value. Uh, and basically we're creating a vector um, that defines a gene expression pattern that we want to pull out. And, you know, you can, this is the, the output page, the text heavy. Of course, you can get the um, uh, raw data, but you can also view that as a heat map. And you can see that we can quite nicely pull out genes that are expressed in roots of salt stress plants at 24 hours, uh, which is very uh, useful for um, defining sort of expression markers. And we've, we've updated this in, in 2016 to have a kind of pictographic interface where you can dial up the expression that you'd like to see in uh, particular, um, you know, data sets. Uh, you'd like, so in this case, we're trying to pull out genes that are 
turned on in response to heat uh, after three, four, or six hours. And we can pull out those, uh, those kinds of genes and use those as expression markers. And this, uh, we, we actually published this and we were able to identify um, genes that are, uh, uh, you know, specific for PAMP triggered immunity or uh, effector triggered immunity or compatible interactions um, based on publicly expression, public available expression data sets. Uh, we've, uh, we've also used that approach for cis element prediction. We've been able to identify uh, known cis elements uh, uh, for heat uh, response. For instance, we made uh, some guess markers to show that in fact, we're able to uh, put our predicted cis elements, which are actually known uh, uh, heat response cis elements upstream of a minimal 35S promoter to get um, uh, 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 like uh, gas, gas expression when um, the plants are subject to heat. So there are lots of hypotheses to be generated uh, using expression angler. So basically a third of the genes have one co-expressed gene or more uh, in across any data set. Um, and you know the kinds of hypotheses that you can generate are are like as follows. So uh, this is a paper from Elliot Myritz's group uh, at Caltech. And he uh, showed that um, floral homeotic genes are the targets of uh, RGL2 with you know, elaborate genetic tests. Uh, and you, know, the, you see these phenotypes in, in RGL2 mutants uh, in, the, in the flower. That wasn't really examined before, but if you um, go and do a co-expression analysis with RGL2, well, what do you get back? You get back sepalata 2, sepalata 3, agamis, pistolata, apatala 3, and apatala 1. These are all floral, floral homeotic genes. So basically within like one minute, you can generate those same hypotheses that uh, the, the Myritz lab was able to um, come up with, uh, you know, very, very rapidly. And then there are other uh, proteins in here or genes in here that uh, have no annotation. Um, you know, are they also involved in, in floral development? So people are using co-expression screens to identify genes in novel contexts or not novel genes. Um, this really works. And uh, we've actually done that to identify um, regulators of dormancy and germination in, uh, in seed biology. Uh, so basically what we did here was we took uh, database of, uh, we generated a database of 175 uh, samples, um, many, many published experiments looking at, you know, uh, gene expression during dormancy, gene expression during uh, seed imbibition, this sort of thing. Uh, and we put them into a, a large database. We calculated all uh, gene co-expression scores, all by all um, gene co-expression scores. And then we filtered this database of interactions to come up with a, uh, a database of more than four and a half million interactions. And we visualize that with Cytoscape. So this is uh, SeedNet and somewhat pleasingly, it kind of looks like a, a Arabidopsis embryo. It's divided into three parts. This part here is the, uh, so the, the genes are colored whether or not they are expressed during dormancy, if it's red or during germ germination, if, if they're blue. Um, and then there's this kind of transition zone between these networks. So the, the nodes here are genes, the edges are co-expression, significant co-expression scores. Um, and then as sort of biological validation, what we did was you zoom down to part of this network and we looked at the ability of uh, several of these uh, genes that hadn't been identified to be involved in uh, uh, seed dormancy or germination as to whether or not they could germinate on, on ABA. And in fact, um, 50, more than 50% of them uh, showed a phenotype in response to um, ABA. So that's you know pretty high success rate, uh, higher than if you were just to use gene expression, induction or repression on its own, um, and certainly far higher than sort of a standard uh, mutant screen that you might do, um, and all with sort of publicly available data. So I'm going to switch gears now, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, protein-protein interaction data. Uh, we 
predicted the first Arabidopsis interactome um, uh, several years ago. And uh, that consisted of about 80,000 interactions. And uh, right now we're actually at uh, more than 100,000 confirmed interactions from the literature. And the predicted interactions came from um, the genome uh, sequence databases. We looked for orthologs of, of the um, of yeast fly worm or human genes in the Arabidopsis genome to come up with an ortholog list. Then we took the interactome databases from those organisms and did a match replace on the orthologs to create an Arabidopsis predicted interactome, did some uh, quality control. And of course, we've uh, made all of those interactions, the predicted interactions, as well as a uh, fairly extensive collection of, of curated interactions available through uh, back then it was Arabidopsis Interactions Viewer 1, now it's Arabidopsis Interactions Viewer 2 uh, that has uh, more interactivity. We've also added 2.8 million protein DNA interactions, as well as uh, most recently around 29,000 Arabidopsis uh, thaliana complex interactions uh, from the Marcotte lab. Um, uh, uh, where we sort of communicated back and forth with them because they used uh, eggnog identifiers as opposed to AGI identifiers. So we sort of, they're, they're, sometimes these curation processes, as I'm sure many of you are, many of you know, are not always uh, as streamlined as we would like them to be. Um, the other nice thing about uh, AIV2 is that you can see for a given um, uh, chromosome what the uh, AGI IDs are that interact with uh, a given uh, transcription factor um, or promoter at least, uh, and whether or not there's overlapping interaction uh, or unique interaction. Um, you can also upload your own data uh, from, from Cytoscape uh, and you can also organize the layout according to kind of like a hierarchical uh, layout where you go from the outside of the cell down to the to the nucleus in sort of a signal transduction kind of cascade. You can overlay um, gene expression data from our extensive uh, gene expression databases to see if there are any subnetworks that are defined by their expression expression patterns. Uh, so lots of new features that we've added in, and that was worked by uh, Vincent Bao in my in my lab. And from uh, uh, we've also got some. Uh, structurally predicted interactions, which I'll tell you about in a second. So I'm gonna switch to uh, protein tertiary structure. So um, we actually predicted the first Arabidopsis structurome 10 years ago before AlphaFold was even a twinkling in Google's eye. And uh, we came up with 29,000 structures uh, exceeding a cutoff threshold. Uh, and those were predicted using FIRE2 in collaboration with Lawrence Kelly and Michael Sternberg at uh, ICL. And that, that uh, coverage uh, encompasses about 23,000 unique AGIs or 84% of the proteome. We've loaded those into ePlant, uh, which, uh, which I'll show you in a bit, uh, along with uh, 885 structures from the PDB. And the reason we did this was we thought it would be useful uh, for identifying structural motifs of interest or for identifying regions that might be solvent exposed or in a potential active site or for predicting protein-protein interactions. So um, this is the second part of a story about predicting an interactome for Arabidopsis. Uh, there are that number of genes uh, encoded uh, in the Arabidopsis taliana genome, uh, TER10. Uh, there are an estimated 300,000 binary interactions uh, from um, Pascal Brown's uh, 2011 paper. Uh, only 6,000 were released in, in that paper. Um, we had 80,000 predicted uh, or 70,000 predicted interlog interactions. Um, and, you know, so there's definitely a gap. There, we noted that there was a gap between this this value here, 300,000, and the, the, the amount of data that were available, especially from the AI1 uh, main, main screen from, from 2011. Uh, so we thought, could we use uh, predicted protein structures to 
identify potential interactions. And you can do this with a program called HEX, which um, basically allows docking between two molecules. Uh, this could be a small molecule, this could be another protein. And basically what HEX does is it measures the energy of uh, interaction in all possible, not, not all possible, but many possible conformations uh, where you rotate around the, the one protein around the other, you turn that protein in, in X, Y, and Z uh, dimensions um, to, to find the best interaction score. And then you can use, uh, what we did uh, was we actually used a reduced subset uh, that had good coverage and 50% uh, identity to the chosen template. So basically we tested a million interactions um, using HEX uh, and we took the top 1% of those interactions and subject those to go-term enrichment analysis. And the enrichment analysis, this was our sort of test uh, to see whether or not our method was working, showed enrichment for certain co-localizations, co-biological processes and co-molecular functions. And then we also tested a subset for physical interactions via yeast 2 hybrid. Um, and these are just some of the, the results um, out, uh, uh, of testing PPIs using uh, HEX on, on real data there. This is our uh, uh, the, the ROC curve for um, uh, uh, confirmed interactions in the uh, database, AIV predicted interactions. Um, and, you know, at least in this range, uh, we're actually performing quite well. This is the negatome results here, where these are proteins that have been shown to not interact. Uh, and you can see that there is sort of co localization enrichment. So if proteins are going to interact, they should at least some of the time be in the same subcellular compartment. Uh, and then we tested 200 pairs using yeast 2 hybrid. Uh, there, there were like five sets. Uh, our predicted interactions in the, the top 50, top 1%. We picked random pairs from, from the background. And then we also tested some of our known interactions from, from the, from the AIV database, and these are just the these two hybrid results. I, I kind of this was a double blind experiment. Uh, Michael didn't know the the uh, the orderings of the the interactors on these plates, and uh, these are the results. So basically, uh, the number of interactions that we were able to recover for known protein-protein interactions, these are AIV confirmed interactions, published interactions was just under 50%. So we took a naive approach. We just took the full length cDNA uh, and we put that into our UST hybrid vector. So we weren't able to hit 100%. You know, theoretically that should have been 100%. We weren't able to achieve that. Oftentimes for those kinds of experiments, especially used to hybrid, it's a bit of an artificial system. Uh, you have to make truncations, this sort of thing to, to show interactions with these two hybrid. These were our predicted interactions. Um, and then, uh, in fact, for our uh, docking results, we're, we're not that far off of the um, AIV confirmed level. So we were, we were quite excited about that. We've put those into the AIV database. They're, they're flagged as you know, predicted interactions based on structural uh, docking results. And the idea here is to fill in gaps in some pathways. So these, uh, this is actually a, a, an interesting signaling pathway that leads from a, a pseudomonas syringae effector all the way down to um, transcription factor and DNA targets. Uh, and this is the, the gap that is predicted based on the, the structure-based interactions that we, that we developed. Um, we're also using this predicted structurome to identify small molecule targets, uh, or we would like to. And this is just an example of our HEX results using uh, BRI1, which is uh, the arsenalide receptor uh, and its small molecule ligand, arsenalide, uh, and another receptor, TDR, I think it's also known as uh, PIXI, 
Um, and uh, it's peptide ligand here, shown in, in blue at the top. And when we do docking results with hex, we see that uh, brisinolide docks here, uh, the TDIF peptide docks here in those receptors, uh, um, kind of the best. And there isn't, you know, there, there is specificity in other words. So we're, we would really like to build a web interface we would really like to also um, have the ability to introduce mutations and see how those mutations, say from, from 1001 Genomes data, affect the ability of a small molecule to bind to a given uh, uh, protein. So that's kind of the, the end goal here of, of all of this. And have we want to have a really nice interface to be able to do that. And, you know, have it happen instantaneously. You know, these docking things actually take quite a lot of time. And um, yeah, so we'll see where we get with that. We have, I have a student working on that right now. So how can we integrate co-expression, PPI, and other data? Uh, we've developed, again, uh, this interface, and this is the, the concept drawing, uh, to be able to navigate easily between these uh, levels of biological scale, uh, kilometer scale, natural variation, centimeter scale is sort of tissue level expression, millimeter scale is, um, you know, cell type specific expression and so on. And in fact, uh, my first data visualization grad student, Jamie Ways, built this interface. He actually designed the interface. He didn't do the programming, he just conceptualized it. So we start at a couple of uh, meta levels. So we have the um, uh, sort of the, the curator description. These, these data are from TEAR. We get those data from TEAR as feeds, uh, um, gene models, uh, DNA sequence information. We also have publication information at another meta level. At the first data level, we can see variation in gene expression in ecotypes collected from around the world. And you can overlay that, uh, that map. So we, we map those ecotypes back to where they were collected. We've also added in climate information. So the idea here is that if you see uh, variation in expression that seems to correlate with, say, rainfall patterns or heat patterns, you might want to then go, go to um, you know, perform a GWAS analysis, uh, uh, maybe with ERA GWAS or, or, or ERA Fino and see if there, there are any kind of linkages that, that might be of interest. At the centimeter scale, we can see um, the, the expression pattern in Arabidopsis tissues. Uh, at the millimeter scale, you can see the expression in certain cell types in in uh, in Arabidopsis. At the sub sub millimeter scale, you can see the the protein localization. These are data from SUBA, um, and uh, we're looking at uh, ABI three, which is a transcription factor involved in uh, seed maturation, seed development. And we can see that, in fact, we do see strong localization in the nucleus. But if you didn't know what the gene product did, uh, and you saw, say, a strong localization in mitochondrion um, from some high throughput experiment, then you might think that that gene product is involved in mitochondrial biology. Um, you can, at the micrometer scale, you can see where the gene is localized, which arm. Uh, and also at the micrometer scale, you can see the protein-protein interactions for your uh, given gene product of interest, as well as protein DNA interactions. Um, and sort of at the, the smallest scale, at the nanometer scale, uh, we can see the predicted protein structure. We've also, uh, one of the themes of ePlant is this idea of integrating across scales. Uh, and we've, bring, we've brought in um, features from the conserved domain database, as well as from PFAM. And you can see that, the, interestingly, the DNA binding site is on one face of the predictive structure. It's not really contiguous in sequence space, but it is, uh, uh, at least in structure space, it's all on one face of the, of the protein. You can also explore natural variation, natural variance, and you can see this threonine to asparagine uh, mutation here. These are data from the 1001 genomes project. From the, I guess you could say from the kilometer scale, you can map where that uh, mutation occurs that occurs right here. That's quite near to the DNA binding site. So the hypothesis that you could generate there is whether or not this um, mutation actually 
affects the ability of ABI3 to bind to its, um, its uh, cis, the cis element, the, the ABRE. Um, and then also at the nanometer scale, we uh, have a feed from um, Tear's JBrowse instance that they've, that they've recently taken over. Um, so the ePlant architecture allows for separation of database and visualization. Uh, we can easily call up data from any resource really, and then we can build these viewers uh, to, um, to, to have modules in ePlant. We've got 15 new ePlants that we've uh, rolled out. Uh, some are more complete than others. Um, we've uh, recently, we're, we're continually, continually adding data sets. So most recently, tomato uh, root cell type data sets from the Brady lab in, in the tomato e-plant or a barley spike meristem uh, expression data set uh, from um, uh, uh, Tia Ladal 2021. So we developed this barley viewer for them. Um, and of course, we can add any kind of quantitative uh, data into ePlant. So Klepnikova's uh, RNA-seq data set. We've also recently developed a proteomics viewer uh, in collaboration with Glenn Urig's group at the University of Alberta. Um, but we can also have complex data types. So the, the Expressalog viewer that I showed you uh, towards the start of the talk has been re-implemented uh, by Chantal Ho, actually. Um, and then she kind of brought that into, into ePlant. Uh, we've also got now a Reactome uh, Pathways viewer that uh, another student, actually, Jamie Waze's son, uh, implemented for us uh, in, in ePlant. Um, and there, again, it, it, it's sort of, it's nice. You can see the gene that you're interested in, that you're looking, that you're exploring. You can see its expression pattern simply by mousing over that the gene identifier. So as I mentioned, so Chantal Ho made that, Roy Lee made this one, and Ben Ways Perlman made, made that button. That these are undergraduate projects for, for, for bioinformatics students. Um, just wanted to touch on uh, Thalemine. So we, uh, I'll be finishing up soon. Um, we worked to uh, sort of resuscitate Thalemine, which had been built by Aeroport. Um, and we've taken on the management of that. Uh, and you can read about that in this, uh, in this paper by um, Asher Pasha et al. And um, I should point out that Andrew Farmer and also uh, Tanya and, and her group at Tear took on uh, building other aspects of, uh, of airport and maintaining other aspects of uh, past airport uh, infrastructure. Got a couple of new tools, uh, one for exploring gene regulatory network data, another one for exploring uh, variants, uh, as well as uh, we will roll out Gaia soon, which allows you to, it's supposed to be like a Siri for uh, plant biology. Uh, you can see, of course, the, the um, summary information. You can also see um, uh, expression, where the expression is highest. We also scrape figures from PubMed where your given gene of interest is uh, mentioned in the figure. And we do that, uh, we identify those about 65,000 uh, papers. We identify the gene models, and then we uh, do OCR to identify the text in those gene models. And then you can ask questions like, is my gene mentioned in the same figure as uh, my another gene of interest. Uh, and you can have that highlighted in the figure output. Um, and I'll just finish up in the last few minutes to tell you about the International Rabbit, Rabbitopsis Informatics Consortium uh, and some of the work that I'm doing with the Plant Cell Atlas. Um, and so the Plant Cell Atlas is an effort to document you know, subcellular localization, expression patterns in all the cells of, of several different plant species that's spearheaded by Sue Ree at the Carnegie uh, and, and Ken Birnbaum at NYU and also Dave Earhart at the Carnegie, as well as many, it has many uh, members from around the world. It's an NSF uh, RCN. Um, and we've spent quite a, basically the past summer thinking about, you know, is there existing infrastructure that we could repurpose to um, put plant cell data into, 
Uh, the HCA could be, the human cell atlas uh, infrastructure could be repurposed. It would require quite a bit of uh, modification wherever these logos are to, to make it work. The other um, perhaps more promising uh, way to uh, encompass plant cell atlas data is to use the single cell expression atlas at the EBI. So, um, uh, so um, Irene Puppet Theodoro uh, and her team, uh, Sunita also at, at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, have been working to get single cell expression data for plants into the single cell expression atlas. And what would be nice for the plant cell atlas would be to have the ability to access this in a, in a programmatic manner. Uh, so we're sort of uh, talking about having that happen through the, the SCEA. And as you might be aware, we've also set up through IAC uh, these web services that allow the, the EFP pictographs to appear on, on tear uh, gene pages uh, and in Thalmine as well. Uh, and Carson Andors on the call, I think too, uh, we've added, we've worked with them to um, have maize EFP images embedded in the maize GDB pages, soy KB, peanut base, several, several other databases use web services that we provide uh, to display expression pictographs uh, on these resources. Uh, we also have uh, web services for protein-protein interaction data. You can fire up Cytoscape, bring in protein-protein interactions from the bar. It's easy peasy. Um, and just to you know, come back to guard cells. I know you probably were wondering what is the state of art in, in 2021, 2022? We're doing intact in guard cells of droughted plants and we're able to introduce a small tag into nuclei, pull down RNA, uh, nuclear RNA, and we can get that quite nicely. Um, and we're actually in the process of looking at knockout plants and whether or not they, uh, of the genes that are increased in expression in, in droughted guard cells or decrease in expression in droughted guard cells to understand their role in plant drought response. Um, so that's it. Uh, there are differences uh, and that's it. I want to thank everyone who's uh, worked on the bar over the years. Uh, and uh, if you are interested, there's a plant bioinformatics course on Coursera that you could take to learn about many of these uh, and other tools, 33 different tools. Um, from around the world. Uh, so that's it and I'll take questions. Thank you. Um, um, okay, so I will ask one question, Nick. Thank you again. Thanks very much uh, for providing us detailed information on BAR. And I'm sure a lot of people will be interested to use this resource to explore large data set from plants across species, and they will get deeper insights into biological questions. I especially like the tools for identifying expression markers and the cis element prediction. And just wondering like that cis element prediction that you are doing, this is based on the non-position weight matrices because I saw some PWMs over there or it is de novo and so so there so we have tools for both um so we have uh sort of mapping tools and we also have prediction tools um in that case uh those um the the ones that we tested we we ran them through prediction tools um to try to predict novel cis elements, novel cis elements. um yeah Okay, my another question is this, that currently this resource is mainly dominating on Arabidopsis, and we are very much interested to use this resource for sorghum. So wondering if you have any plan to include sorghum in future? Uh, we do actually, we've been working with, um, who is it, uh, at Cornell, Andrew, uh, uh, sorry, Andrew Nelson, I wanna say, but, um, we do have a sorghum EFP browser in the works. Okay. The summer student who was working on it uh, this summer didn't quite finish it, but it's it's pretty close to being finished. So it's not only sort of a developmental atlas, it's also a, uh, what else? So there's a bit of a um, uh, 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 stress set, sort of a chemical, uh, you know, nitrogen deficiency, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. That's wonderful. That will be really useful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, see, chat box. Okay, Laurel has the same question. I saw them. There is a question from Tanya. Yeah, so I, I will tweet. We'll tweet out uh, when we've got the sorghum uh, browser working. Um, but to Tanya's question, so how do we design projects for undergrads to work on? Uh, uh, so the, they're they're great undergrad uh, undergrads at U of T. So typically they approach me for a project, and I'm like, well, I've got this project to develop a button. Uh, uh, to, to do some, some kind of analysis that could enable this. It depends on their skill sets. Sometimes they do the analyses that kind of are hidden behind the button. And sometimes they'll do the web programming. You know, if they're, if they're skilled web programmers, they can actually build the interface uh, for the button. So it, it, it's, it depends on the kind of project, what, what, their, what their skills are. Um, but really we've had great success with this. It's kind of a, our alternative funding model to uh, the subscriptions. You know, they're paying us to to do these projects. So that's how that's how our funding works. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. And how long do they end up working with you? Is it like a year project or? Yeah, it's like an, an academic year, so an eight month mm -hmm. project typically. Okay, yeah. thanks, Nick. Yeah. I think Andrew has one question. Andrew. Uh, yeah. Um, great talk, Nick. Very. Um inspiring. Um, I was wondering, so you mentioned kind of bringing in the 1001 genomes variation data, um, which I guess would mostly be SNPs, um, but there's also kind of the pan genome uh, view. And I'm wondering if you guys have thought much about how to incorporate it's like presence, absence variation or things like that. Right. So, um, we're actually developing a pan genome expression viewer uh, with the same some of the same collaborators for the uh, for the for that barley meristem view. So they've got a, an oat pan genome uh, data set, six different tissues. Uh, it's also like a bit of a nightmare with like A, B, C, A, a B, and D genomes. You know, hexaploid stuff, um, and we're trying to figure out the best way to display that those data. So it'll be, you know, uh, on a uh, ortho group basis. So the, the data that we're getting from them will be based on ortho groups. And then for each genotype within within the 24 genotypes that they've uh, that they've generated expression data for, there'll be three boxes for the A, B, and D genomes. There are about 9,000 genes in oat that have one-to-one, -one, like perfect one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one, uh, homologs across all uh, ecotypes. And some, there's some might, there might be a, f a few more that are missing genes in some of those varieties. So in that case, we would just gray out the, the corresponding box. Um, the trickier case is what to do, you know, there's one, there's one ortho group uh, in one variety that has like 300 uh, genes for a given for variety and subgenome, like you know ortho group genes. But what do we do with that? You know we can't ex we can't show 300 sets of data. Like it's it's uh, so do we show the the one that's kind of the best match in terms of like an expressolog score? Um, do we show the average across those 300 genes? It's like, yeah, it's it's sort of a, it, it's an issue, but we'll start with the easy case, one-to-one-to-ones across all of the varieties, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, there are a couple of questions on chat, and this one is, how do you cop up with the up updated genome and <clears throat> annotation versions with a reference to EFP? Right. So. Um, we have pretty limited resources in terms of, you know, bioinformatic technicians. Uh, so what we do in that case is we typically work with our partners, you know, we, we, we publish together with people and then we go back to them and say, okay, so for, for, you know, 
uh, tomato, there's an updated genome version. Can you remap? Can you do the remapping for us? Uh, um, I think with the plant cell atlas data, the nice thing about uh, plant cell atlas data going into the single cell expression atlas is that that is all part like the remapping for updated genome versions happens automatically when there's an update to a genome in ensemble plants, you know, so that uh, that's kind of an, an attractive thing. And then we could maybe go back and, you know, maybe become more integrated with, with, uh, you know, with, with ensemble plants and the, the expression data sets there, because it's a ton of work to, to redo the, the mapping. Um, and we, we don't really have the resources to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's another question. Um, how do you deal with the amount of expression data for all the crops you cover? Can you keep up to add them all or do you choose important ones? Uh, so honestly, it's been a bit, uh, it, it's not really, um, there's no strategic vision. <laughs> it's more random. And uh, we, we people will approach us and say, oh, can you add this uh, this particular data set as of you in, in ePlant? And we're like, yes, let's work with you. And, you know, uh, we'll add this view. And that's that's kind of how how it, how it goes. We, we do identify um, some data sets that we, we would really like to see in, in ePlant, uh, but certainly uh, we tend to work collaboratively with, with others to integrate new ones. So thank you, thank you very much. I don't think we have any other questions. Yeah, so it was really very interesting talk and we really enjoyed it a lot and it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Great, thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks Nick, thank you everybody for joining. Bye.